Hello and welcome to our experience chat with Todd Treseder. Today we're going to be talking about retirement and Todd has written a book called How Much Money Do I Need to Retire and we're very very thankful to have Todd here from FinancialMentor.com. Todd, thank you so much for your time today. Thanks Mike, I'm enjoying the contrast between my image and the image on the slide there. <laughs> uh, it's, it's clearly time for me to change my uh, press photo, isn't it? Oh, that's right, that's right. <laughs> well, I really, really like the goatee. Awesome. Um, Todd, uh, before we begin, I wanted to ask you about just about your background and if you could share with us like what got you into helping others with their finances. I came out of the hedge fund business and um, I sold the company and I had saved quite a bit of money and so I pseudo retired, if you will. You know, I, I put retirement and let me see if I get it in the camera air quotations, right? <laughs> um, you know, and that's something we can talk about if you want. But anyway, so I came out of there and I had a lot of people ask me how I did it because it's pretty unusual for a 35 year old single male to quote unquote be retired. And so I had a lot of people ask me questions. And this was back in the, you know, go go days of the late 1990s when everybody wanted hot stock tips and everybody was getting rich off technology stocks. And people really didn't even have the right questions. They didn't understand how wealth was built. Everybody thought it was about finding a good investment or a hot stock tip. And so, um, you know, I just, I would blow it off. I gave blow off answers. I was standoffish. And uh, my wife one time finally just said, Todd, you spent all this time learning this stuff, figuring it out. It worked for you. Why don't you yeah. figure out how to share it? Why don't you figure out how to get it out there? And so I was just insane enough to believe I could actually help people. I mean, I mean, yeah, I, I read that in your book that you you retired at age 35, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, can you share a little bit how you became financially independent so early on? Yeah, I actually have a post on my site that explains it exactly and provides all the math behind it. It's called How Anyone Can Retire in 10 Years or Less. And that anyone is literal. Um, anyone can retire in 10 years or less. That's all I did. And what I did was I saved 70% of my income. Um, and it works out mathematically. It takes you about 10 years. And so it's not rocket science at all. And then there's really, there's two, and I go into it in the book, the, you know, the how much money do I need to retire book. I go into it. There's really two big numbers you have to pay attention to. It's your savings as a percent of your income and your investment return relative to the inflation rate, you know, the spread between your investment turn and inflation rate. Those two numbers literally determine your financial independence. Everything else is a detail. They're small details. Those two numbers are the big, big enchiladas, the big apples, whatever you want to call them. They're the ones that really matter. You get those two right, you can be wrong on everything else and you still come out fine. And so, you know, I did the savings rate really well in the early going and I came out of the hedge fund business and so my whole career plan was to figure out how to invest so I could get the spread on the other numbers. So basically, I came into it fully conscious of what the key numbers were, how it worked mm. together. I've always had kind of a mathematical mind or an engineering type mind, and so that's how I did it. Did you, as your parent, did you make any assumptions about retirement or mistakes along the way as you were doing this? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm human. I make tons of mistakes. I still do to this day. Uh, one of the really obvious glaring ones, you know, we write the book we need, right? Yeah. Um, I wrote the book, How Much Money Do I Need to Retire? Because I got the estimate wrong. I figured it out wrong. And basically, almost all the information out there is incorrect. Um, you know, there's several published books on the subject, you know, um, and the mainstream thinking is not the way it actually works in practice, and the latest research proves that out. And so I was coaching clients on this subject and realized that nobody really understood this and everybody was making the same mistakes I did. And so just to cut to the chase, one of the mistakes I made was I retired on what I thought was plenty of money for what I spent at the time, but then I promptly got married and had two kids. Hmm. And so as you know, you're a family man as well, yeah. uh, my expenses went up a little, like a lot. Uh, <laughs> You know, and, right. and the other thing that happened too was I didn't really understand that, you know, it's one thing when you're a single man, you're fully in control of your finances. Like, my needs are really low. I'm a bookworm. I love reading. I love research. Um, you know, I'm an outdoor recreation enthusiast, and that's not expensive. Those joys that I have in life are not expensive joys. 
And so I never really spent a lot. But, you know, I'm not in charge of spending when I've got two teenage girls. Um, you know, they've got their own values, and they're trying to find their own way in the world, and it's not up to Daddy to say that you need to be frugal or you need to establish certain values. I have to respect their needs. So, you know, I just had a lot to learn about, you know, what it meant to become a family man after, quote-unquote, retiring. Let's put it that way. That was probably my biggest mistake is not, not really getting the expense picture right. You know, there's other ones, too, I can share, like, I wrote in the book all about this whole concept of sequence returns, which is a pretty technical thing. I don't know if you want to go into it now. But there's this whole concept of sequence returns risk, and there's this whole concept of drawdown and how it's multiplied by your spending patterns off your assets. There's a lot of there's a lot that goes into it that I explain in the book that I didn't understand, and I made all these mistakes, and that's why I wrote the book is to help people out. That's awesome. Now, now I'm really curious. So you, you mentioned your daughters, and... You're you're a financial mentor and and an advisor. I'm curious how you're raising your daughters to be prepared financially for retirement. Well, <laughs> they don't want to hear from me. I'm the father. <laughs> it doesn't matter that I'm established expert, right? I mean, that has nothing worth saying and nothing worth listening to. It's kind of a family joke, actually. <laughs> I have ideas that I share with coaching clients at the rate of about $350 an hour, and uh, my kids don't want to hear it from me. <laughs> so anyway, that's so um, funny. Yeah, so how do I work with them? I try to lead by example. Mm. I mean, that's part of what financial mentor business is, is uh, it doesn't make a very good uh, example for your children if I'm basically laying around and trying to play golf all day. That's not how you set an example for your kids about how you build a future for yourself. And I'm very passionate about financial mentoring and what I'm building there. So um, you lead by example. You know, we're not wasteful around here. Um, we try to make smart decisions. We try to teach them how to make smart decisions. One of the things we're doing now, like um, with my older daughter, and we're actually starting to do it with my younger daughter too, is they get a budget and then they go and buy their own things. So if they want to buy clothes at the thrift store because they can find good values and they can get more clothes for themselves, that's up to them. If they want to go buy designer clothes, then that's where they can blow their budget. It's up to them. Mm. You know, and so we're trying to help them understand how to make money work and and all that. And the whole idea is that they learn small lessons now that, that compound and they get that experience now when it's not important and it's not critical. Um, yeah. So anyway, those are some examples. Awesome. Thanks, Todd. Todd, you write about a, there's a difference between financial freedom and financial independence. I've never heard anybody talk about that. There's a difference between those two. Can you talk about what are the differences between those two things and where retirement fits in? Yeah, I, I think you're really referring to the idea of personal freedom and financial independence, are you not? That's right. Okay, all right, because financial freedom and financial independence ring pretty close to me. Personal freedom and financial independence, or personal freedom and financial freedom, are very different things. Mm -hmm. And so, like, to give an example from my own life, you know, I, I was quote unquote financially free at age 35. That ushered in one of the least happy periods of my life. Hmm. Uh, shortly thereafter, it was kind of this great thing. I hit this pinnacle, I achieved this goal I'd set out for myself. And what I didn't understand was that I was not personally free. Um, I had all kinds of personal issues. I had a lot of problems. One of the whole motivating factors behind becoming financially independent was acting out this low sense of self-worth. Right? I had this low sense of self-worth and I thought, well, I'll validate myself by becoming this great success within societal's term, you know, society terms, and that's going to validate me. That's going to make me an okay person. It didn't. All it did was it made me the same person looking in the mirror, but now I had enough money to have to dwell on it. I didn't have any excuse for my unhappiness. You know, I had to find that within myself. So, um, you know, personal freedom is a whole other thing. I teach a process called Seven Steps to Seven Figures, um, and that's something I've mapped out over years with my coaching clients, understanding that basically everybody maps in to one of the seven steps regardless of when they come to me in their, in their cycle of building wealth. And the seventh step is that personal freedom number. I mean, the, the, the personal freedom idea. The whole idea is, you know, so now you're a millionaire, so what? Right? You know, so what? So you achieved a million. Big deal. Mm -hmm. And so, which is a funny thing for a guy that teaches people how to build wealth, but that was my experience. And so I've been living that seven steps. So like steps one through six, I've already lived. And so I'm teaching what I know, and I've been teaching my clients forever. 
step seven is something I'm personally living, still establishing that personal freedom. You know, uh, in, your, in your book, How Much Do I Need to Retire, you talk about the problems of conventional retirement planning. Can you talk about what that model is and what are the problems you see with conventional yeah. retirement planning? Absolutely. Um, there's there's a set of assumptions, you know, let's just call it five, seven assumptions depending on the calculator you're working with or depending on who you're talking to on it. Because um, some of these assumptions are assumed by the calculator and others you have to assume. But anyway, there's these grouping of assumptions. And when you plug numbers into a, a calculator, you've got to understand that this is not, like there's a book out there by Lee Eisenberg called The Number. Well, it's a myth. There is no number, right? You remember those ads where people are walking around the street and they have these red red numbers flashing across their forehead and when they hit their number they're suddenly free. Mm. Um, yeah, that's garbage. It <laughs> doesn't work that way. There is no magic number because when you try to figure your number, all you're doing is making a mathematical rejection of a set of assumptions into the future. And if you're there's certain assumptions in there, I shared with you the two key sets of assumptions. Yeah. If you get those off by a percentage point or two, depending on your age and other assumptions in there, it can either have the number or it can multiply it by two, three, four times. And so these key assumptions can literally invalidate the entire process if you get them wrong. And so let's take one as an example. Okay, let's take inflation. Inflation is one of those key numbers. And you're supposed to estimate that thing, like in my case, I was 30, I'm supposed to estimate it 60, 70 years into the future, right? Mm -hmm. That's wash. even now. I'm 52 right now as we record this. And so I'm supposed to estimate inflation 40 years into the future, 50 years into the future, depending on how healthy I remain and lead a normal life. I mean, PhD economists who have studied this, done their PhDs on it, can't get it right one year into the future. Mm. How am I going to get something that I have no control over right for 40 years into the future? It's hogwash. I mean, it's pure nonsense. Or here's another one that's great, is you're supposed to estimate your life expectancy. Nobody can do that. You have no idea when you're going to die. <laughs> right? I mean, right. It's absurd. It's absolutely absurd. And here's the thing, right? It works for life insurance companies. It works for the Internal Revenue Service because it's an actuarial process. Statistically, we know on average where people are going to die. Okay? But the problem is for any one individual, you're one person. You've got one retirement. You've got one lifetime. There's no actuarial reality to it. There's no statistical reality. It's completely random. You could die today. You could die 50 years from now. And it's all, there's no reality to it. So those are just two assumptions. I mean, I could go on and on yeah. and on, but that's, that's what underlies that retirement calculation. And so obviously, it's not science. It's not a number that you can actually hang on to and believe that that's your, your retirement number. And yet, that's what everybody teaches. You go into a broker, they're going to sit you down, they're going to ask you assumptions, they're going to talk about your family health history, they might adjust your expectancy up or down. They're going to go through all these steps, and it's hogwash. It hmm. doesn't work that way. Hmm. So, so what is what is a path to begin discovering uh, the number or or how to retire? What what is the path? Well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what you mean by the path. If you want to understand, like, how do you wrap your head around the process? Is yes, that kind of what that's mean? right. Yeah. So it's fine to do the number. Right? That's a starting point. That's where you want to start, is go ahead and do your retirement estimate using reasonable assumptions. Okay? Just understand that the map is not the territory. Right? You're trying to set a map. You're trying to find that star that's true north. Okay. So, like, you know, if you, if you find that you need $2 million to retire according to your assumptions, well, you know, you've got to start saving and you've got a goal there. And so you can start engineering your way to the goal. You can start planning your savings strategy, plan your investment strategy. And that gets you started today because procrastination is the biggest wealth killer, right? So at least it gets you started today. You're heading in the right direction. You've got some ballpark estimate. That's fine. Then as you get closer to retirement, you can tighten up your estimates. You can see what your returns have been. You can see what your spending patterns are. And you can estimate it again. The key point is it's an iterative process. It's not a set it and forget it process. Mm -hmm. It's iterative. The other thing you can do is you can stress test your number by using conservative and optimistic conservative and optimistic assumptions. So or conservative and aggressive assumptions, I guess you could, would be a better way of saying it. So you create what I call a confidence interval. 
So you'd have your high estimate and you'd have your low estimate of your number. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, so there's a variety of different tools I teach in the book. There's other ways of approaching it too. You can approach it purely, like another mistake that's made in retirement planning is everybody talks about the assets, right? How much money do I need to retire? It implies the assumption, which is it's all about acquiring assets. It's really not. That's a myth, okay? The real game is about cash flow, right? Because in the end, what you spend is cash flow, hmm. right? The assets are like a second derivative, if you will. It's the assets that drive the cash flow. And so you can plan your retirement around cash flow. You can do a whole cash flow model, which is much more accurate and requires much fewer assumptions. And so, again, I explain all that. Okay, wonderful. Now, you, you have created like a dozen different retirement calculators, which are available on your site, financialmentor.com. Uh, can you talk about the ultimate retirement calculator and how it's different from the traditional retirement calculators? Yeah, so one of the keys I teach in retirement planning is that it's really about life planning and then engineering the numbers to it, right? So when you think in terms of retirement planning, you want to think in terms of your life and how you want to live your life and what your life vision is. And so everybody's going to be different. Some people have some rental houses that they might be selling or living off of. Other people might have annuities. Other people might have pensions. Other people might have none of the above. Some people might be consulting or working part-time or develop a a hobby business. There's all these different ways of approaching it. And so one of the things I teach is that there's a lot of creative angles on retirement planning that aren't well known. Um, you can dramatically transform your numbers. So for example, there's the rule of 300, which is that uh, for every thousand dollars that you spend in retirement, it, it costs about $300,000 in assets to support it. So a thousand dollars per month requires about $3,000 in assets. So there's two different approaches. You can liquidate or reduce the amount of spending you need, or you can increase the income. Um, so those are two examples of different creative strategies. So you could take on part-time work, or you could find out how to live on $1,000 less, and that changes your asset required picture by 300 grand. Um, so anyway, get back to your question. The whole point here is that retirement calculator, there's nothing else like it on the net. And what it did, I needed something like that to help my coaching clients through the planning process. And so it allows you to do all these things. It allows you to do what I call scenario analysis, where you develop your life planning scenarios and you engineer the numbers using that calculator. And again, there's nothing else like it on the net. It, nobody else allows all the different entries for post-retirement income streams and selling assets and receiving inheritances and all the other assumptions that I allow you to put in there. That's awesome. I want to encourage everyone to go to financialmentor.com and check out the ultimate retirement calculator there. Um, also, if you're wanting to know more, please check out Todd's book that you can get at financialmentor.com. I'll also be linking to it in the show notes uh, so you can see um, all the wonderful reviews uh, about this book on amazon.com. Uh, Todd, thank you so much for joining us today. At the end of every hangout, I always ask our guests, five questions just to get to know you a little bit more personally. First one I have, I mean, you write so much. I've seen and I've read so much of your articles on your blog. Um, and also you've written, you know, many, many books. When and where do you like to write? Well, I write in my office with the door closed um, when total silence. I have to shut everything off. Um, you know, I'm easily distracted. And so I just have to put myself in a chamber and write. <laughs> do you, is there like a certain time of the day you prefer to write in? Well, I would prefer to write in the morning, but I don't really have that choice. Again, i got a family, and so my wife and I alternate workout days with getting the kids off to school. And okay. so, um, you know, I'm usually working out or getting the kids ready for school. Um, so I just fit it in where I can. You know, sometimes I'll get a bug late in the evening, but, you know, the idea is if you're going to write, you got to write regularly, and so you got to carve the time out in your schedule. That's right. What, in, what inspires your writings in your books? Uh, my clients. So my coaching clients, I see the problems that are not solved with the conventional wisdom. I see what problems they're facing. I see where conventional wisdom is wrong. And then I provide solutions. So all my books have been that. You know, the investment fraud book, it's not a popular book. It doesn't even have a single review on it. Um, but I've had people who wrote me and said that I say, I, like I had one guy write me a little while ago, I saved his investment club because oh, they, wow. they were going to make an investment in what was a fraud. 
and they were going to put a big thing in it. They were ready to go, and one of the members found my book and realized that what they were looking at was a fraud, and they avoided it, and six months later, uh, it did go bust. Oh, wow. And I literally saved their investment club with that book. So, you know, or like the variable annuity book. I had so many clients getting ripped off with variable annuities, you know, where it was an inappropriate investment for them, and um, I just... It was so difficult to explain them, I had to write the book on it, and I got it down to like a 30-page manuscript that explained it succinctly, because it's, it's probably the most complicated investment out there, a variable annuity, and to really understand it and who it's appropriate for is really difficult. Um, so anyway, and people are very subject to the salesman's hype on that, because it's really easy for these guys to position it as if it's good when it's really not. Um, so you know that one, and how much money do I need to retire? Every client had that question. Again, the traditional wisdom on it was entirely wrong. Uh, my financial coaching book, I wrote that because I'm a financial coach and I see what's going on in the industry and I see how people are getting ripped off. So I wrote a consumer's guide to financial coaching. So every one of my books is a response to client need. Wonderful. Uh, what are your favorite foods and restaurants? Oh boy, it varies day to day. You know, I mean, a lot of salads. You know, try to stay healthy. I love Thai food. Love uh, I love world food. You know, some Mexican, Italian, Thai. Um, you know, I'm probably about 80% vegetarian. I mean, I still okay. eat stuff, but I mean, I eat focused fruits and vegetables. Nice. Um, ancient grains. So just trying to stay healthy. That's wonderful. Now I know you're bu busy writing, and you're a family man. You're very, very busy. But are there any television shows or series that you enjoy watching? I don't watch TV at all. Okay. Zero. Um, the I occasionally watch movies. I love movies. I love a great story, right? So movies, yeah. when they're done beautifully, I'm just, I love them. Uh, but in terms of mainstream TV, I haven't watched it in at least a decade, I think. Okay. We don't, yeah, we don't even have cable here, and um, the antenna for the TV doesn't really even work. <laughs> That's great. You know, like, like when the Olympics came on, I had yeah. to get it all through the internet. You know, we had to stream it all from the internet. I mean, literally, I couldn't even watch it. We got this beautiful TV because we watch movies, right? Yeah. So we got the whole, like, movie theater thing set up, but I don't watch any TV at all. Okay, last question is, do you have any shout-outs to any any bloggers, any writers you'd like to, you'd like to uh, highlight? Um, well, PT Money, Phil Taylor. I mean, if it wasn't for him and creating the Financial Bloggers Conference, you and I never would have met. So shout out to PT for putting it together and connecting so many people in the industry and uh, putting together a great event for everyone. Phil Taylor is awesome. Well, well, Todd, thank you so much for being part of our Experian video series. Uh, this has been a wonderful chat with you, learning about retirement. I want to encourage everyone to check out Todd's book, How Much Money Do I Need to Retire? Again, you can get that at financialmentor.com. And on the Experian blog, you'll find links uh, going to other great resources that uh, Todd has written on his blog, um, as well as links going to the Amazon page where you can buy his book directly and also get a sneak peek at what's included. Um, Todd, thank you so much again for your time. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. It was great talking with you. Okay, I'll talk to you later.